Now, I speak at a lot of schools. And most of you, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, are there any people here who are already associated with a school? Oh, okay. Oh, my mistake. You all look so young. I thought you were all freshmen here at EIU or seniors at best. Oh, okay. Well, if you're at a school already, and if you know your school to have speakers in now and then, and if by the end of the session you kind of think maybe your school might be interested in having me, you might want to take one of these, give it to your principal or head of, head of your math department. Now, I bring that up because in the middle of this little flyer, I happen to have a group of 11 problems. Let me show you what the 11 problems look like. And I posed a question. How much time do you think it would take to get through those 11 problems? Now, most of you, and try to come up with an answer, are probably saying, well, let's see, I'm, you know, obviously he doesn't want us to use a calculator. Fine. So the only other answer for you or for your students, if you don't allow them to use a calculator, is the old-fashioned algorithmic method. The algorithm on multiplication, on squaring, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, I don't know how long it would take me to get through these. If you want me to just take a wild guess, I don't know. Fifteen minutes or something like that, I don't know. But, but, if you master the speed techniques, some of which I will show you today on squaring and multiplication, I know that I can get through all those problems. The last time I did it uh, about a week ago, 54 seconds, less than a minute for sure, less than a minute. That means we have to average about five seconds per problem. For some of those, I can't do that. I can't do that subtraction problem in five seconds. It takes me about six or seven. 215 squared, that takes me about six or seven seconds as well. But some of these others, you can come up with the answer just so quickly. And again, I'm going to show you how today. So that's, that should be some pretty good motivation, both for you as well as for your students. Now, if you want to become good at speed math, learn all about speed math, it's going to take a little recipe for success. Let me show you what that recipe looks like. It's a six-step recipe. First, of course, we have to learn what are these shortcut techniques. When we want to square a number quickly, what's step one, what's step two, what's step three? I'm going to show you some of those today. The others are in my book. Number two, you're going to have to become well-skilled in your arithmetic facts. Now, you people, I'm not worried about you. Oh, math majors in here, you know, 7 plus 8 equals 15, and, and 8 times uh, 8 is 64, and so forth. But you know the kids. Uh, can't come up with all those answers instantaneously like we'd like them to. Um, I've had teachers tell me, and I'm not surprised anymore when they tell me this, they'll say, uh, you know, I don't allow my students to um, uh, use a calculator, but boy, you know, they just don't know their multiplication tables. They have to think and think and think about the answer. Uh, but I just can't make them memorize things. Well, wait a second. Who's running the asylum, first of all? I think if you feel it's important for your kids to know their multiplication tables, I mean, that's part of the curriculum, and you're going to insist that they memorize it because it's going to counterpart their grade, even if it means giving oral exams in, in some of the multiplication tables. Uh, however, one of the reasons the kids are reluctant to learn multiplication tables and number facts these days, I think, is because they're sort of upset with you because they want to what they're saying inside of themselves is hey look I got a calculator I can figure out all these computations that you, you want me to memorize I don't have to memorize I know you don't let me use them in a the classroom but when I'm out of the classroom I hey, look at this boy I do this and this two plus two look at that it's got a four there isn't that great there's no there seems to be no, no motivation for them to learn a gentleman in Canada uh, was one of the vendors a few years ago, and he gave me one of these as a gift. I don't sell these, but he does. He's got a website, flashmaster.com. Maybe there's better ones than this around, but this is kind of neat. It sort of lends credence to the idea of if you can't beat them, join them, insofar as the technology is concerned. Uh, kids love technology. Back in my day, we learned by way of flashcards or going home to mom or pop and having them 
drill us in our multiplication tables. Now, it doesn't seem to work as well. Uh, I've used this during the summer with these elementary kids, and they just love it. Uh, what happens is you program it first for a time, anywhere from 30 seconds to three minutes. I've got 30 seconds right now. And you also choose the operation you want to work with. I've got multiplication right now. And when you hit on, or start rather, the 30 seconds starts winding down, it gives you a problem, three times four, which we think is 12. We punch it in. It gives you another problem, two times five. Now eventually, seven times three, let's say we get that wrong, we think it's 20. Well, it's going to put up a question mark, meaning you got the wrong answer. Try it again. Uh, I think seven times three is 12. They're saying, no, you dummy, it's 21. Here, we're going to give it to you one more time. Oh, seven, I know what it is now. It's 21. So I learned by that. Three times four is 12, and seven times three is 21. They give me that one again. Two times three is six. Finally, my 30 seconds is up, and they show that I got five right out of seven for 71%. Uh, of course, I got the same problem wrong twice in a row there. The interesting thing about this is it takes whatever problems you got wrong and it stores it in its memory. So I can come back to this later and I can just ask the machine to present me with the problems that I've gotten wrong in the past. And again, you can uh, program this to give you addition problems, subtraction, multiplication, or division. I can tell you, I know what the question is, what are they sell for? Uh, this guy sells them for $49.95 if he hasn't changed the price. But you can check that out if you're interested. Um, if I was teaching on the elementary level, I think what I would do is I would, I would ask our principal if he could uh, ask the librarian to get one or two of these for the library and have the kids work on them in the library, maybe during the lunch period or whatever. Or if you have enough money, you have one, one or two in, within the uh, office of the uh, math department whereby you can borrow from them. But anyway, um, technology may help. Uh, number three, three is basically for adding and subtracting. Good eye movement is very important, but the better a reader we become, the more we improve with that ability. But it, uh, number three isn't going to help us too much with squaring or with multiplication. However, number four sure is memorization of two-digit squares, ideally to 30. If you can learn them up beyond 30, that's great. It's going to help you. Not just because you're going to be able to square a two-digit number more readily, but because it's going to help you with a lot of the shortcuts in multiplication, as I will show you. Now, when we, multi when we uh, memorize our uh, multiplication tables up through 12, we, of course, are at the same time learning the first 12 squares of the whole numbers from 1 to 12, the last three being, of course, 100, 121, 144. But how many of us can go further? How many of us know that 13 squared is 169? 14 squared, 196. We keep going. 225, 256, 289. 361, 400, 441, 484, 529, 576, 625, 676, 729, 784, 841, 900, 961, 1024. I could keep going like that, okay? And by taking the time to memorize those, again, as you'll see later on today when we get into multiplication, it can help me with some of these shortcut methods. We want to get away from using slash marks and the little written carry numbers, especially in addition and subtraction. And of course, we want to get away from calculators and traditional algorithmic methods because they're all too time consuming. And actually, the two most important of these six are number one and number six. You've, <clears throat> you've really got to practice, but if you do, I guarantee it's going to pay off. If you memorize your squares up through 30, uh, I mean, here they are, that's what they look like. Of course, it doesn't do me any good to tell you that uh, 6, 176 is a perfect square, unless I can also tell you 676 is a perfect square of 26. You have to be able to associate it, of course, with the number. Now, let's get into uh, squaring. We'll stay with squaring until about 1010. OK. One of the things that you notice in just about every textbook, in the back of the book, there's a table of two-digit numbers and their squares from 10 up through 99. You know, you, you wonder what 65 squared is. You go to the back of the book, oh, there's 65 squared, or your students do that. Uh, one of the ways you can really entertain yourself is do what I did here. 
I've, I wish I had three overhead projectors right now because what I've got here, I, I broke them down into tens. The teens, the 20s, the 30s. Here I've got the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, if you really want to see the beauty, the beauty in math, take a look at some of these. For example, let's take a look at the 50s. And in the 50s, just concentrate on the last two digits. 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81. <gasps> Perfect squares. You say, wow, what a coincidence. I'm sure that never happens anywhere else, does it? Well, wait a second. Let's take a look at the 40s. 0, 81, 64, 49, 36, 25, 16, 9, 4, 1. In the opposite direction. Wow. You look at the 60s and you go, oh, well, no, the 60s. No, we, we ran out of them here with the 40s and 50s, didn't we? Yeah, there, there, there's no more like that. Wait a second. How about the 90s? 0, 81, 64, 40, et cetera. Just like the 40s. How about the 70s? You say, well, there's nothing special about the 70s. Ah, look at this. 71 squared ends in 41. 79 squared, 41. 84, 84, 29, 29. 76, 76. Symmetry. And you'll find another one in there the same way. But let me point out something else. You look at the 80s. You say, well, yeah, but look at the 80, 61, 24, 80. Hey, there's no symmetry there, and they're not perfect squares. Nothing special about the 80s. Oh, no? Take a good look. Although I shouldn't ask you to do that, because I took a good look for weeks and months, and uh, it took me a while to figure it out. But let's take the number 81. Last two digits are 61. What's special about 61? Does anybody know? OK. Uh, what's the difference between 50 and 81? 31, right? Does anybody know what the square of 31 is? It's 961. Or, instead of finding the difference between 50 and 81, what about the difference between 81 and 100? You say, well, that's 19. What's 19 squared? 361. You could do that with all of these. Now, that's just the beauty of math being exhibited there. It's not helping us with any shortcuts, but I just wanted to point that out. There's some other things that I could show you if we had time, but I want to get into some of the shortcuts.